Old New York Fashion Week frenzy. And the young and the stylish have gathered to see the latest ready-to-wear collection by luxury designer Josie Notori. Josie's style is always very classic, very feminine, yet there's always something very modern to it. And this is the woman behind it. To me, that's the most important thing, that the consumers come and they like it and they buy it. With a clear vision and straight direction, not to mention her elegant demeanor, Notori is a natural in the fashion world. Hard to believe that this was not her first career choice. The Philippines' native first broke ground on Wall Street as the first female vice president in investment banking at Merrill Lynch. But her entrepreneurial urge would steer her away from suits and into the world of lingerie. I think it would be even more dramatic. Now, after more than 30 years in the fashion industry, her pieces sell for anywhere from 18 to more than $2,000, making Josie Notori a multi-million dollar lifestyle label now spanning clothing, homeware, fragrances, and even eyewear. This week on Talk Asia, we follow Josie Notori from the high street in New York to her factory in the Philippines. Welcome to the factory. And discover how her Asian roots inspired her to become an international fashion force. Welcome to Talk Asia, Josie. It's a pleasure to meet you and I have to say that great minds think alike. Oh. I'm, first, thank you for having me here, and I'm so glad we're in the color of the season. <laughs> it is the color of the season. It's good to know that the Notori brand as well. I'm in line, in sync with the Notori brand. <laughs> oh, Describe okay. for me what Notori means to you. You know, Notori has been really, for 35 years, bringing art into life with an east-west sensibility. I've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, build a brand that you know, I can relate with, with bringing beautiful things to, for every day and making women feel good about themselves, what they wear and what they surround themselves with. Um, it's been a great journey. How do you keep it alive after 35 years? Keep it fresh? You know, it, it, it's very, um, uh, it's a really good question. I, I am a pianist at heart. I've been, um, since four years old, I think that's the artist in me that I feel like it's never finished. You're always trying to create, the, make the note better each time. You don't ever play it the same. So I'm always looking for the next new tone and the next new creation and the next new evolvement. And so it's been a journey and the brand has evolved. In, it's where it started in lingerie today. It's a whole lifestyle from ready to wear to accessories to home. A lot of people, a lot of women have bought Notori. I mean, I, I think, believe that in uh, 2011, your retail sales were reaching about $150 million on, yeah. I think, average. How did it all begin? How did it all begin? You know, I never imagined, Monica, that I would ever land in the rag trade. I always knew I'd be in a business. But I thought it'd be in Wall Street. So I was in Wall Street, actually, for nine years. Then I got bored. By accident, really, I landed in this business. I was really trying to buy and sell and looking at things in the Philippines of what I could make a business in. And lo and behold, a friend sent me this embroidered blouse. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Let me see who there's an interest in this. And um, by accident, I um, met a buyer at Bloomingdale's who said, well, why don't you make this into a night shirt? And I had no idea what a night shirt was. Mm. So that was the beginning of Notori Lingerie. See, that's really interesting because you were, you said you were in finance. Yes. You know, you were the VP at Merrill Lynch, the first female VP at Merrill Lynch. There is a sense of uh, security, uh, somewhat, some would say, especially at that time, to have um, a well-paid job. Um, and you did have a well-paid job at the time. Very, yes. And yet you took a risk to say, it's not enough. I'm bored. Where do you think that confidence came from? You know, I, I think that mm, coming from a very strong family and strong role models, my grandmother was an amazing entrepreneur and, you know, that you could be whatever you want to be. And when that um, joy or the challenge was gone from Wall Street, even though I was the first this and first that and made a lot of money, I, there was something missing. And I knew that, you know, when you wake up and you're not really excited about what you're going to do, I wasn't going to accept that. And I think that's really the, music, the artist in me. 
So yeah, talk to me about that search. So I decided that I would like to look at all kinds of businesses from McDonald's franchise to car wash. <laughs> you know, my husband and I were speculating, but when I realized I can't relate to that, yeah. I decided I want to go back to my roots in the Philippines. And that's really how it began, that I wanted to go back and have something to do with mm. where I come from. The idea of the Eastern aesthetic yeah. at the time in the 1970s, early 80s, how widely accepted was it, do you think? I think we brought in an idea that was very unique at the time. It was th the beginning, it, because it really wasn't your typical lingerie. It really was a blouse. It's, and that's why Notori, all these years, have, has always been about inner wear, outer wear. You know, it just ha they're really clothes. You can just happen to sleep in it if you want to. The fact that you've got stores like Bloomingdale's, you've got stores Sachs. like uh, Sachs. What, Sachs. Sachs was the first one to buy. Yeah, these are, these are massive department stores that any young business or designer would dream yes. of um, having interest in. How do you think you got that? You know, I, I was very fortunate. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Um, it certainly was so much easier then than today. Um, I really had no connections, Monica, and I knew nobody. It was cold call, I think. It was a cold call? Everything was cold call, and I think my Merrill Lynch card that says vice president yeah. <laughs> maybe gave me a little credibility in the beginning because I would just cold call and say I'd like to make an appointment and you know at, at the end they all came to, I was showing uh, the first collection in our um, apartment well I had a baby in the crib. baby in the bassinet in the, <laughs> right next door with a telex machine you remember it <laughs> this was before you were born the telex <laughs> machine um, and you know it, it it was so easy because I got orders like that in, in, in a week. Welcome to the factory. Coming up, Josie gives us a rare look into how her designs become reality. Hi, I'm Josie Notori. I'm excited to show you my first uh, flagship boutique in Asia, right here in the stands in Manila. Very excited about this boutique as it's the second in the world. The first one is at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York, and we opened this literally um, seven months ago here. The entire season is just an explosion of amazing prints that is very um, much inspired from patterns in the Philippines and from the ikats and the batiks and the just happy colors, fiesta colors that you can see in the Philippines from the gypsies and all of that. I mean, I, I, I do want to show one amazing color. And look at that, that's typical. You know, we spend so much time with prints, people have no idea what it takes to be able to get these colors. But to me, this is such a amazing example of Happy Philippines. Huh? Tell me about the journey where you go from design to store. Um, how difficult is that journey? People have no idea what it takes to create a collection. I mean, you know, honest, honestly, um, the amount of work that goes mm -hmm. by the time you see it in the stores. It, it's really hours and hours, I mean, days, weeks, months, and then when you see what's done in the factory, it's, you know, it's worth every penny. <laughs> but it, 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 but it's, it's a fun process, because then when you see it at the end, and yet whether you have your show or whether it's in the stores, to me the, the, the most rewarding thing is when it sells. That, that to me at the end is the ultimate uh, gratification. And um, I devour looking at selling reports every week. That to me is the, the real testament whether your concept a year ago worked. When it comes to the, um, the, the, the female silhouette, what do you think makes a woman sexy? Because you deal with that yes. part of the female form. The yes. lingerie is probably one of the most personal, personal, intimate parts. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I think that 
I was lucky enough to start in a category which is very personal to Muslim and lingerie, and I always um, marvel when you know I go to a cocktail party and we, you know men will say, "Oh, I sleep with you every day." <laughs> I think their wives do that, or <laughs> that's a great line. <laughs> or women say, "Oh my God, I still have that gown that I have from 20 years ago." I said, "Will you please throw it away?" You know, <laughs> but there is a more emotional yeah. connection to lingerie. I mean, I you know because it's the closest thing that you wear and it's the foundation and and it makes you feel like a woman but when you say sexy you know um i think that when something feels good and you feel glamorous it's being sexy i don't know have a judgment of sexiness doesn't mean you have to show everything i used to think sexy was dirty <laughs> You know, being when Asian, my upbringing, yeah, Asian, yeah. right? <laughs> but not really. You know, today I say it's sensual. It's sensual. It wasn't sexual. an accepted word for a long time. No, no. It took me a long time to even say the word sexy. I said now say sensual. I could say the word sensual, but mm. today I really realize no. It's about being feminine. Mm -hmm. So this. This is our underwear, little boutique here. Here you can just see, yes, we have the black and the beige, but it's also about, you know, colors. This is the number one, this bra, which is the feathers bra, is the number one selling bra in Nordstrom of all the bras. That's quite amazing. You blog a lot. I've been reading some of your blogs, and you, you mentioned your family, your father in particular as well. He, he just celebrated his 90th birthday, was that Actually, it? Actually, 92. He'll be 93. 93. Can you imagine? 93. Yes. Um, how important is that relationship and that kind of influence on you? Oh, so important. My, I think my family has been the rock, you know. Um, my father um, is a self made man just amazing and totally inspiring and my mother um, built the business with him so his example of building something he was the only one who graduated from his family who went to college and proceeded to help his entire family so <laughs> so I think I've got great genes you the oldest of six children yes. how much pressure do you think there was in you to set an example to really forge your own way I was not only just the oldest of six children, as the oldest of 33 grandchildren. So I actually grew up, I, I don't ever think I owned a doll. So I grew up always with adults and um, spent time with my grandmother who was really probably the, she was a feminist in her time, an entrepreneur, and I would go around with her from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the evening during the summers and watch her conduct her businesses. So um, I, I think from an early age on, uh, early age, I was exposed to driven women and working and having a career. The interesting thing about the Philippines and the culture that comes from the Philippines is that it's a very matriarchal society, isn't it? I always say my first asset is being a woman, second is being a Filipina being Asian, um, Filipino specifically, and I think that this genes of a matriarchal society, strong women, very much um, um, has been an asset for me. If you think about it, I never was afraid. I never had, I, I, it never occurred to me that I couldn't succeed in Wall Street, and it never occurred to me that whatever business I would go into that I wouldn't be successful. So I think it was just that having that, I wouldn't say I never had fear, but in a way some fearlessness, you just go for it. Welcome to the factory. Well, this is our sample room here in the factory where it all begins working with our New York team. Uh, this is where, really, 
the craftsmanship that is the signature of Notori. This is where it begins. Craftsmanship in the Philippines to me is like nowhere else. So they finish one of this in one to two weeks. Finish all of this. You see how you have different layers. It's there's a technique. It's quite amazing the labor, but it's a labor of love, you know. And it's an art form that the women in this country just. I think it's our in our hair. It's in our blood, and they enjoy it. They love it. Coming up, Josie reveals what it takes to survive in the design industry. It's a really tough business. Really tough business. I had no idea. Look at that hair. Wow. <laughs> Keeping that clip. I think our ready to work collection is fairly young. It's the youngest of all our different collections. I would say my baby. You look so serious. <laughs> I think this whole thing for fall, the Chinois survey, which is just we've always been about the best of the East and the West, the powerful and the feminine, and so inspired by Shanghai and Paris in the 30s. Chinoiserie to me is a real embodiment of that woman today. The industry, as you say, is extremely tough. Mm -hmm. How important is it for you, or had it been for you, uh, to feel a sense of acceptance from the yeah. The powers that be that are within this industry, whether it's the magazine editors or whether it's the buyers. It's about the product. It's not about me. It's really about the product. And as long as you keep evolving the product, believe me, they're going to be there, the acceptance. But to me, it's, it's a two-way street. You know, and as long to me, it, you, you know, I, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't listen. And I think it's that, whether you listen to the you know, the editors, what they think is, you know, in terms of, of, of trends, whether you listen to the retailers, this is what the customer wants. I feel like you, you never can stop listening and learning. And you, we're still learning. Do you still get nervous when you show collections? You know, it's like opening Broadway. Mm -hmm. That's pretty nerve-wracking. It's pretty nerve <laughs> You know, you could show the collection and say, I don't like it. <laughs> or, uh, you, I don't like the colors. Yeah. And by the way, that happens. Really? Where they'll say, it's not good, you know, I, I need, and you just scramble and you say, okay, you adjust things and all of that. What kind of experience that you acquired while you were on Wall Street helped you and continues to help you today? I, I don't think that I could have survived this business if I did not have the foundation of Wall Street. Because yeah. at the end, it's really about a business. I have not, never really, you know, lost in the mire of just fashion, fashion. To me, fashion is a business. Mm -hmm. What kind of skills do you think are required in order to run a business like yours? I, in number first, it's a really tough business. Mm -hmm really tough business. I had no idea what business I got into. Mm. But, you know, I love it, so I think it's okay. In terms of the skill sets, there's the creative side and there's the business side. Um, um, you know, I, I, I think you have to understand where your strengths are. I've been fortunate to have a little of each one. Which do you prefer, the creative side or the business side? I, I, you know, that's a hard question. I would say I enjoy very much being on the creative side, but I wouldn't be happy with the creative side if I can't accomplish the 
business side. I, I have to say that I have sacrificed the business side or making money for the sake of free agent to build a brand. You know, through the years where I probably spent an inordinate amount of money yeah. uh, in terms of our product development and design that most other companies probably would not have that kind of patience. But to me, it's for the sake of building a brand, it was okay. So, so it's not always about just making the bottom line. It was for the long term. What kind of challenges do you did you find? The fact that your your company is also you work with your husband, um, and you work with your son now. Um, what challenges does that present? Yeah. Well, let's talk first with Ken. Um, I convinced him to uh, leave Wall Street after 18 years to kind of in in after the company had been about eight years old because I felt like I, n I just kind of needed some support. And so he, at the time, really courageously <laughs> left an amazing, amazing career and really Ken was an investor and was involved in other things. So there was never a uh, uh, conflict. Mm. And one thing I will say, Monica, that for Ken and I, it was always clear that if something ever had to give, between business or marriage, the business would have to give. And also, your son is involved as well with uh, the business? Well, Kenneth, who, of course, to my husband. I mean, he was there from the, the get-go, <laughs> from, from the crib. He would hear the Stelix machine. But we always wanted him to be a banker, too. He was a banker, too. So he actually was in Wall Street and, uh, and never thought he would want to join us. Mm. And, you know, uh, it's been the best thing because I don't need an exit strategy now. He's the exit <laughs> Where do you see your brand going? How big do you want it to be? I feel like we're We still have ways to go um, The last ten years was uh, spent in really uh, Crystallizing the brand you know it has it's it has an international reach. It's not an American feeling or Philippine thing you know really I think that that all our products really has a great potential for a you know global and we are um, in more countries than the US today and so I'm pretty excited about actually the growth in Asia and yeah you know it's like really coming home um, you know the notorious the best of the East and the West and I really would love to be able to build it make this an important brand in Asia Thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure oh, to meet you. Thank you, Mons. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.